everyone and welcome back to another episode of the writers podcast i have with me the returning shining twins <laughs> kelly florence and meg Hofdale. and i think i said your last name better this time right? yes <laughs> wonderful thank you <laughs> <laughs> so it's been almost a year to the date i think the last time you're on was april 18th 2022 wow. and here we are it's april 13th and almost a Friday the 13th, but it's <laughs> sadly, it's a Thursday the 13th. So if people want to get into a deep dive of a deeper dive of who you both are, they can listen to that episode, uh, at least the first half of it, and they'll get your background in that. From that, I will ask you both to do a quick little summary of who you are. So I'll start with you, Kelly. Why don't you tell everybody who you are? Yes, I'm Kelly Florence, co-author of six books in the Science of Horror book series, which my best friend, Meg Hoftal. I'm also okay. a teacher. I teach communicating arts at Lake Superior College here in Duluth, Minnesota. Very good. And Meg, when yes. you're out, out exercising? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yes. I was saying I was out exercising today. Um, it's beautiful weather here. So yes, I as well, right? Uh, as Kelly said, I'm um, the co-author of the books with her. And then I'm also a fiction writer. I'm a novelist, short story writer, got audio plays uh, done. So, yeah, I, I kind of like to do, get my hands in all the horror pies, I guess you could say. All right. And you've worked together on a nonfiction series. You have, as you mentioned, I think six books now? Yes. Yes, six, or you will have six soon. You have The Science of Monsters, The Science of Serial Killers, The Science of Stephen King, personal favorite of mine, The Science of Women in Horror. The Science of Witchcraft, and this September, you're yes. having a another book, The Science of? Agatha Christie. Okay. That's a little bit of a tangent, Agatha Christie, or do you consider it because it's a murder that it fits into the horror genre? How did, how did that come about? We call her sort of like horror adjacent. Mm. And, you know, after rereading a lot of her books to do this project, I was like, wow, this is horror. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I have a little bit more of a, a wider, broader idea of what horror is, but I think mm -hmm. Agatha Christie certainly knows how to build suspense, make us scared for our characters' lives, and also something that horror does that I think Agatha Christie does really well is sort of point out social issues and um, things like that that were kind of happening in her time in England. And so I think it actually fits in better than even maybe we thought at first. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And another thing that we realized is that her science that she wrote about, of course, there's a lot of poisonings and chemistry involved. It was mm. very accurate as we were uh, interviewing experts and chemists and scientists about the science found in her stories. She did her research. She knew her stuff. Mm. Interesting. And I guess she's in a uh, kind of a way, sort of like a pre precursor to the X-Files, which I, if I remember correctly, you were both bonded over initially, right? Exactly. Yeah, I mean, she has this like mystery of the week, which is kind of mm -hmm. what was going on with the X Files. She kind of has that feeling with her books. And one of the things that we learned about her that I didn't know is that she worked in a pharmacy um, during the war. She volunteered oh. there, and so that's how she got a lot of her ideas. Mm. She learned about poisons and things like that, um, <laughs> and uh, used it to her advantage. So I thought that was really cool. All right. So uh, what other things did you get from Agatha Christie and from a science perspective? Yeah, science-wise, we discovered all sorts of tangents that we went down. Uh, one interesting thing, well, it's not necessarily maybe science-related, but she disappeared for a while. And mm. we know, no one really knows what happened in the, in the days that she was missing. But we talk about you know, memory loss and, and possible explanations for why would you go missing and not tell anybody where you were or what, what could have mm. happened? Okay. And do you want to tease us with what you came up with or is that <laughs> something you want to say for the book? Yeah. Well, you definitely have to read the book, but it's, it's mm -hmm. interesting because it has inspired so many different things, like mm. creative people to write books. There's something called the, the Christie affair, a recent book that came out. Mm. There's actually a film, a 
all sort of playing on what was happening during that time period. Of course, the film posits that she was actually solving a crime during that time. Mm. Cool. So it's really fun to kind of see how different people have sort of taken this little mystery because it was quite right. at the time it was quite a, a big deal that this big important novelist went missing. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm guessing as I'm also a mother and a wife, she just needed a break. I think that was probably what was going on. But so you're going to go missing sooner. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you heard it here first, folks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so. Agatha Christie is obviously a very well-known literary figure, and there's been a lot written about her. What did you hope to bring to the table that nobody else had brought with your book? Or was that even a consideration? I think, you know, as with our Stephen King book, it's mm -hmm. part biography and then delving into her stories and the science. But mm -hmm. I think what we discovered, and same thing with Stephen King, is what was happening in the world at the time what was mm -hmm. happening in her life and what were the real so historical things that were happening that inspired her in her settings and her stories and, you know, her love of, of Egypt and her travels and how many times she did take trains and mm. boats and everything that she was living, she put into her stories. And so I think that that was really fascinating to learn about her. Mm. Did you talk to interview anybody about her uh, specifically? I don't maybe experts, family members, if they're, I don't even know if she has any living relatives. But. Well, she does have a, a living grandson and mm -hmm. he actually has provided, we didn't interview him, but he has provided a lot of great uh, sort of biographical information that we use uh, actually at her website. He runs her whole sort of estate mm. and he shared some really cool stories about what it was like to have Agatha Christie as a grandma, which I thought was so cool. <laughs> and I think another point to like what we sort of wanted to do with this book, I have this sort of like, I have a background in like going to school for literature and a lot of mm -hmm. people were very down on Stephen King when I was in school. It was like, Oh, well that's not real literature, you know? Right. And uh, the same with Agatha Christie. I think she gets sort of a bad rap sometimes is like, Oh, that's what my grandma reads or like, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's like, she just, you know, had a book a year or more than one book a year. She just turning them out. But really, if you really read Agatha Christie and give her a chance, she's actually a really deft writer. And she's very funny and, and something that she does that Stephen King does as well is she likes to point out the absurdity of sort of humans. Mm. And I really enjoy that about her work. And I think that if anything, I would love to have people come away who maybe haven't actually read her going, oh, actually, she sounds amazing. And I want to read her books and give her the props that that she has to do because she really is the queen. Mm. And. Like Stephen King, she produced a lot of books. So <laughs> yeah. was it was it a prerequisite for you both to read all her books before you did this book? Or? <laughs> you know, having been lifelong fans of Agatha Christie, we had read a lot, but then we picked and chose. I, you know, we could have written, we could write five books about her, but we just chose mm -hmm. certain stories and books that were important to us. We included The Mousetrap, which is not a book, but a play. Mm -hmm. Because we we both love the play so much, and I uh, directed it several years ago, oh, and cool. so um, something that we did is looking at her writing from that mystery point of view and how she sets mm -hmm. up a story and gives those little clues and unveils it to the audience or the reader. And we interviewed a a director who's directed horror and mysteries, and he talked about you know that process of showing just enough or giving enough clues and hints um, to surprise the audience or the reader without giving everything away. Right, right. So how many books did you restrict it to then? Oh, gosh, what did we do, Kelly? Fif 15? I can't remember. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 20? Yeah. I don't know. I was reading a lot of Agatha Christie. Thankfully, <laughs> her books are, um, you know, not super thick. We're not talking Stephen King, right. um, yeah. The Stand or anything. So, yeah, it was, it was, as far as, like, I'm a reader, I love to read. So, a lot of them I had read previously, and some of them I read twice, like, my two favorites. And see, before I started the book, my very favorite Agatha Christie book was The Murder of Roger Ackroyd. But then after rereading, I changed it to And Then There Were None. 
because mm. I realized how fun that book is. I, mm. I love that book. So it's kind of fun as a fan to, be, right. to have a good excuse to like read her whole obor. The other thing we did too is we compared the TV and um, movie adaptations to okay. her stories. And the there are so many iterations of her mm. stories. You know, there's various TV shows based on her beloved characters and then different movie iterations. Even uh, mm. Death on the Nile just came out this past year. So right. it's fun to see how she is still so present in mm -hmm. our society today. Right. And digging into the, trying to dig into the science angle a bit more, like were you also looking at the technology of the era that she was writing in? Like, I don't know, like Murder on the Orient Express, were you getting into train, <laughs> train stuff or? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we get into like history and science. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's interesting to learn about, you know, the actual Orient Express and how that started. And now it's actually up and running again. It wasn't for a long time, but you can actually mm. meet take the Orient Express in, in this luxurious cabin. I think one of them is okay. named for her. But as far as science goes, yes, ob obviously a lot of the science that we we were working on for the book was crime scene investigation, okay. what kind of things they were using then and how that sort of compares to what, you know, we use now as far as footprints, you know, there and there's some basic things that detectives still use today, like a footprint or Obviously, you know, just deduction based on evidence, evidence, yeah. things like that, right. but not obviously they didn't have, which is great because if they had had like DNA back then, <laughs> it would have been great. They would have solved crimes, but from an Agatha Christie standpoint, it's a lot more fun to see Poirot come up with all these insane ideas and be right. So I'd rather right. watch that or read that. So sure. Yeah, it would definitely, definitely science from a crime background is kind of where we, we okay. delved into a lot. And what, b besides DNA, what were the biggest, what are the biggest differences between when she wrote and what we have now? Or like, or did she get some things like totally wrong? Or did she take, like most writers take the time to do the proper research? Or maybe she had a, she knew a police officer that helped, uh, that she consulted and stuff like that? Or how yeah, did that, she, uh... she, she really did the research. And like I said, uh, and Meg mentioned, she worked for a pharmacist. So she knew mm -hmm. her chemistry. She knew drugs and pills. And she actually ended up saving someone's life. She caught a mistake that the pharmacists had made and saved yeah. somebody in real life. The other uh, interesting thing that she did, she did uh, to consult professionals and experts and her writing, I can't remember the story of hand. No, Meg and I have been writing sure. so much lately. But because of the story, oh, yeah. she saved three people's lives because they recognized their symptoms in a character. And oh, so wow. it's it's been, uh, and I think, you know, some people say, well, isn't it better just to sort of make up stuff as you go along? And, and we would say, no, do the research and you're actually teaching people as you're writing fiction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very cool. And it, it, how much did you explore in the, just in the fact that for the time period that she was living in, like that she was able to do all of this writing in what was really just a, a man's field at that time. And she must have been an extraordinary person and just to pump out so many stories. And I, I'm just curious how, she, how she was received by her. Like you mentioned, I think earlier, Meg, that she was, you know, not favorably looked upon, but like how, how did her family and everybody react to her writing and now all this stuff? Yeah. It's interesting. I think, I think she upset her mother because she didn't want to be this sort of like very <laughs> practical housewife. Right. But she does come from a privileged background, which I think obviously helped in right. some ways. But in one way, too, she lived in Egypt uh, when she was a teenager, I want to say 15 or so. And that really, like for a month or two with her, her mother, and, I, and that really sparked something in her. And mm. that's actually where she wrote her first book that no one's ever set eyes on, <laughs> at least no mm. one living has ever mm. set eyes on. She said it was quite horrible but that really that that travel and that sort of expanding her environment i think really really helped her become the writer that she mm -hmm. became even though a lot of her stories like took place on you know a little english countryside but a lot of them took place in places like egypt where she loved and and she was she was can i say bad ass <laughs> there too because she her husband her second husband was a archaeologist and oh, by the way, much younger than her. 
And she uh, went to Egypt with him and other places in the Middle East. And she was very well known to be down there digging Mm. with him, cataloging things with him. So not only in writing was she a superstar, but she also was very much into into archaeology. And then, of course, that translates into her being able to really accurately talk about Mm -hmm. the process in books and things like that. Yes. And of course, yeah, it it was it's been it it still is a man's world. And so the fact that she sort of was able to really be famous in her time period Mm -hmm. as well. She was very well known at the time. It's not like Emily Dickinson where Mm -hmm. we look back and and nobody knew who she was then. And now we all know. But she was very, very, I believe she was knighted or what is it called? No, she's a dame. Mm -hmm. She's a dame. (laughs) So, you know, she uh, she very much held her own and, and she was one tough she would lady. Have to and, uh, yeah. and that was something, yeah, that was something learning about her. Just like, I'm, I'm such a huge fan mm-hmm. of her. And, and I think we should all just have a little bit of Agatha in us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm trying to think, like, I'm, I'm in a way, I'm surprised that she didn't write under like a, a male pen name or something like that. But uh, mm-hmm. I don't know her as well as you obviously do, but it sounds like she was a very dynamic personality. So, yeah. I'm thinking like maybe like Shirley Jackson, but Shirley Jackson was even in a much later time period than her, but mm-hmm. that's the closest pers- other female writer, I think from yeah. sort of breaking ba- barriers that I can think of. So, mm-hmm. so y- your book, is it, is, do you structure it in a, in a chronological order or how did you break out the book in chapters? We did. Since just like Stephen King, since it was part biography, we wanted to make sure that it was Mm -hmm. chronological of when she wrote the books or when they came out, because a couple of them came out posthumously. But it was interesting to see, and especially her journey and then these characters' journeys. And I don't think I'm spoiling anything because it's been, they've been out for so long. But you see these characters getting older when she was getting older and start experiencing things like arthritis or memory Mm. loss. And then some characters, beloved characters even die and they ran an obituary <laughs> for for one mm. of her characters in wow. the New York Times. And so it just proves how prolific she was and how important these fictional characters were to mm. everyday people. And was there any, again, because I don't know her story that well, was there like any undiscovered manuscripts or unfinished books that people are trying to f- find or publish? Or did you look into that at all? I did look, you know, we did look into some of that. Not really. She had, uh, as Kelly just mentioned, she had some books published posthumously, Mm -hmm. but they were known to her agents at the time and things like that. Something that we learned that was kind of interesting later in her life, people, uh, some of her books weren't as well received, her her very Mm -hmm. last few books. And people believe that rather recently, that it might be that she had dementia Mm. in some form. And tests were actually done on her work to see if they could figure out based Mm. on her writing. And actually there was, and we talk about it in our book, there actually is some proof that her vocabulary lessened in the later years Mm. of her life and that she was rather redundant and things like that, which I found really interesting that you could sort of discover something like that within the breadth mm-hmm. of her work and, and and really I think how brave of her and how authentic of her to continue writing even when she was obviously perhaps struggling mm-hmm. with something and that is what's so Agatha <laughs> is that she you know she wrote about what it's like to be a mom she wrote about what it's like to be a grandmother every every sort of aspect of her life all her travel she it's it's there's she's right. on the page and so even in that aspect, she's on the page, too, when, when like Kelly said, she's having arthritis mm-hmm. with, you know, Miss Marvel. So, yeah, I, I just I think that's just so dang cool. cool about and her. which characters of hers are your favorites? I love Miss mm-hmm. Marvel, as Meg just said. I think that she was an older woman who was investigating and she could hold her own. She was <laughs> witty. She was clever. She was smarter than a lot of the local mm. law enforcement. So, you know, she was written that way. But I just think that would that would have been a fun person right. to know in real life. How about you, Meg? I like some of her younger characters, like Tommy and Tuppence. But 
I think obviously I have to give it to Poirot. He's just, I love, I love, well, I love a short King <laughs> and uh, he's just funny and egotistical and not in any way perfect. And he's really hard to take sometimes, but he's usually right. Actually, mm -hmm. he's always right. And so, and, and I sort of love her relationship with Poirot. She kind of like was just tired of him by the end. And I totally get it because he would be hard to take. <laughs> right. So yeah, I, I, I love it. I can't help. It. Okay, cool. So <laughs> maybe a question I should have asked off the top. What, what, how would you position this book to prospective readers? Like what's your log line for the book? I think getting into the, the history and truth and science behind Agatha Christie's life and her beloved stories. All right. And it's a coming out, you said September this year? Yep, September. Uh, so this fall. Okay. And and we have been busy writing our next book, our seventh book together, mm. which is coming out the following year. Okay. So we're we're just gonna keep writing. Very cool. <laughs> and what's your can you tell us tell us what your seventh book is about? Yes. Yeah, so this one is a little bit different. Uh, it's called Goth Girls Guide to Travel. Oh. So it's a travel book. <laughs> cool. We've been traveling all over the United States finding spooky places, oh. um, haunted places, things that we love, and we're doing the research and sharing it with the world. Mm. So after the COVID lockdown finished, you guys got out with a vengeance, did you? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> All right. Very cool. So where, if people want to find your books, where can they look for them? Where, where, wherever books are sold, and you can also find Links for everything on our websites. Okay. Our names, kellyflorence.com and, and meghoffdahl.com. All right. Very cool. And I'll give you each a chance to add anything that hasn't come up during the course of our conversation that you would like to, uh, to, to put out right now. Well, come see us in just outside Baltimore. We're going to be at Horror on Main Convention. We're special guests there. Cool. Come and chit-chat horror with us. What's the date for that? And we also... Oh, that's going to be Memorial Day weekend. Okay. And we also are going to be at the South Dakota Festival of Books in September, which I'm really excited for. All right. So if, if all you are listening from South Dakota, we will see you there. Okay. Kelly, anything to add? I think Meg mentioned everything. I'll mention our other website, HorrorRewind.com. That's our website together. Okay. And, and every event and things that are coming up will be listed there. All right. And Horror Rewind is where you look at old horror movies, I believe. Yes. And, and new ones now, too. Oh, okay. We, we're talking about everything. Ah, very cool. <laughs> and I think that was everything that I had. I want to thank you both for coming back on again. It's uh, great to see you both and wish you all this future success with whatever you're doing. Oh, Kel, uh, Meg, do you, you said you write uh, separate stuff. Do you have anything solo coming out? Hopefully I will be able to announce something soon, okay. but I can't announce anything right now. Oh, but darn. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you'll have to come back on next year and tell us what it was. <laughs> I would love to. All right. Well, it was great spending some time with you again. And hopefully it won't be a, a, a year before we talk again. I hope not. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you very yeah, much. Thanks for having us. Yes. Thank you very much for coming on again. It's great to see you both. And I got to see that tattoo put together again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. And see.